Welcome everyone to another uh, episode or another session of Dress and Drinks, part of the Conversations on Dress for the Costume Society of America. I'm Leon Weavers. I host this um, webinar and, uh, and I'm really excited about today's uh, conversation that we will have. And thank you all for coming. And I'm looking forward to some great conversations um, after this. I would like to introduce today's guest speaker from the Phoenix Art Museum. Joining us is, hi, Helen, how are you? Um, so this is Helen Jean, the Jackie Doran's Curator of Fashion Design at the Phoenix Art Museum. Uh, the museum's fashion design collection features nearly 6,000 objects of couture, accessories, and ephemera. Spanning nearly 500 years from the historical to the ultra-contemporary, the fashion design collection is one of the most unique of its kind in the world. Ms. Jean has been at the museum since 2019 and returned after uh, previously working there from 2007 until 2012. Her background is, includes a BFA from Stevens College Fashion Design and MFA at the University of Lincoln, Nebraska in Costume Design. Oh, Jean, we haven't talked about that. We must. Um, and along, uh, not only am I from South Dakota, but I'm also a costume designer, so we've lots of overlap. Um, and along with the focus study at the International Quilt Study Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, so please, everyone, welcome Jean, uh, Helen Jean, uh, today. And it's so exciting to have you. I'm looking forward to this um, and the things that you have, sh that we've previously looked at and shared. So um, before we dive in, is there anything you'd like to add? And how many things did I mess up in your introduction? <laughs> Well, that was great, Leon. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I um, am just so excited to share the wonderful work we're doing here at Phoenix Art Museum and to get to brag about some of the special projects that we've worked on during the pandemic. And one thing before I forgot, today's cocktail for the evening is the Arizona Breeze. So the recipe is uh, was in the, will be put in the chat for you. And again, I'd like to give a great shout out to Ann Wass for our alcohol-free version, the Arizona Zephyr. Um, always a great uh, title maker as well, Anne. Thank you so much. Um, and so while I'm in my office, I'm I'm just going to pretend since I'm now on campus and we're back. So I uh, so today uh, I I'm just going to sip from a martini glass, but it is non-alcoholic. So. <laughs> Well, I'll cheers to you. I've got an Arnold Palmer from our museum cafe and um, just delightful. And I just wanted to plug that um, prickly pear is such a wonderful uh, addition to drinks as well. And that's a wonderful Southwest flavor to include. Um, awesome. I have uh, some fun material to share with everyone tonight. And I thought mm -hmm. that um, we could kick off with a cool video of a project that we did at the very beginning, uh, well, during the pandemic. Before we start this video, this is, um, uh, we uh, filmed this here at Phoenix Art Museum. Uh, we worked with a production company here in town called Manly Films. And this uh, short film, it's eight minutes long. It looks at a major gift that was um, given to the museum in early 2019. When I joined the museum at the end of 2019, we accessioned the collection, and then during the pandemic, we decided to take a special look at this wonderful wardrobe. This is all the work of fashion designer Jeffrey Bean, and it was owned and worn by um, um, New York socialite Patsy Tarr. And um, this collection is uh, a beautiful look at an entire wardrobe. Um, she wore Jeffrey Bean almost exclusively, especially in evening wear. And we wanted to share it with our audience in a different way. We have not yet presented the exhibition. We are planning that for a future date. But we thought this would be a really wonderful way to explore the connect the collection and of this wonderful background story that we discovered about Jeffrey Bean that relates beautifully to this collection of work. So I'm going to sit back and push play, and I hope Great. you all enjoy this. Who designs clothes like this? You never see this. Even to imagine this, you'll never see this again. Never again. 
I was living in New York, but it was some salesman at Bergdorf Goodman. He directed me to Bean, and I tried on a few things. Jeffrey Bean wrapped up New York's preview of the spring fashions on a high note for then the U.S. designer is considered to be almost above reproach. I just loved the outfit, and they were really comfortable, so I bought them. I was 18 years old. I was hoping to get asked into New York City Ballet because that is what I trained for since the age of 13. And then the moment came where they said Jeffrey Bean came looking for dancers and I wasn't there. And I thought, oh no, I can't miss this. I love Jeffrey Bean. So I went down to his studio and I said, I heard that you were looking for dancers. I didn't get a chance to be there. And would you mind if I were to be considered? And the next day I got the word that Jeffrey Bean wanted me to be one of the four dancers he was gonna work with. Eventually I came to the attention of the Bean organization because they, you know, this mighty crazy person kept buying his clothes. So they invited me to a fashion show told me that if I, you know, really wore all the bean stuff that I've been buying, they'd put me in the front row. After a while, I just stopped buying other clothing to wear in the evening, and I only bought beans. At the day of the exhibit, when we were all in jumpers, especially made for us by Jeffrey Bean, dancing around the photographs in the studio, his assistant came up to me and took me aside and said, Jeffrey Bean has decided that he wants you to continue to model for him. When you look at dance a lot, the thing that you really want to know is what the choreographer was thinking. You have this burning desire to meet the choreographer. And it was like, it started to feel that way with Jeffrey Bean. I felt like I had to get to know the man who was making these clothes. If you put flexible clothing on a a dancer, they'll show you how it moves. And he just gave me that freedom to have his pieces speak, and that's what they did. I went in to talk to him, and I said, look, here I am, here's my life, this is what I do every day, I need some clothes, can you help? And he thought about it for a while, and he said, you know, you really are the perfect candidate for jumpsuits dress them up, you can dress them down, any shoes you want to wear. I swear to you, it solved every problem I had for many decades. As a dancer, I would look at it and first feel a lot of freedom because it's pants. This went everywhere. This was black tie. This was every day. I wore it constantly. I knew not be afraid of which angle the photographer is getting. So you can run around, sit down, stand up. There's plenty of room in that jumpsuit to move around. I could do high kicks. I could do leaps. It looks like a collar, but it's not really a collar. It's just one of the greatest designs ever. It looks so casual. The little bit of red that's on the hip. That just makes the whole thing so sophisticated. Each outfit told its own story, and I felt like I could hear that voice, and I would put it on and I would tell its story. You know, it's black jersey with some white striping. That's not very exciting, but when it's combined with satin and it's cut the way he cut it, that was, I think his great trick was that he cut his fabrics in triangles. That way they fit the body perfectly. And then when they all had to be sewn together, it just made it so much more interesting. Wow. Everything had its own personality. This was his solution for what to put over a jumpsuit. Little nothing jacket, you know, if you were warm, you had a more substantial one, if you got a little colder, and then if you were really cold, he made you a cold. I mean, is this the most magnificent thing you've ever seen? Straight sequins, round sequins, embroidered flowers, different colors. This is incredible. This is a garment that it, it's maybe a yard of material, but he kept piling on. <laughs> And there is such articulation. His work is so unique. Proportions from any other designer look terrible on top of me. He tried to define the body, and he did that in lots of different ways. So you always looked alluring in some way. 
even if it was a very conservative garment. The whole design, it's, it's creating its own choreography on the female body. He always began with fabric. I mean, it was very important to him to have beautifully made fabrics. All this great texture differential and then the, the cutting so that it fits your body perfectly. The detail in these dresses is incredible. The different proportions above the waist, the way the skirt gathers, and the way the underskirt was engineered. He loved these dresses. I love them too. I mean, these dresses are fabulous dresses. It brought me immense pleasure. I mean, really immense pleasure. And I just could never get over the clothes. I, I would just look at the clothes. To me, they were just magnificent little works of art. It is so thrilling to think that such a large collection of Jeffrey Bean's outfits could be on display. Very few people get to see the details up close. It's sort of like a performance is going to be put on <laughs> for the eye. So happy that that's how this has all ended. Now going to be seen by more people. And somehow something happened in between his making that dress and the client wearing the dress. Something happened where you just became a better version of yourself in his clothes. I, I don't even know how to articulate this, except that I was the best I ever was in his clothes. Wow, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Isn't that such a fun story? And and what's really incredible about that is that, again, it's all the wardrobe of one person. And so it gives us such a unique view of that experience of wearing the clothes. And that's the story that we wanted to tell was We've, we've, we've had the view of Jeffrey Bean. We've had the exhibitions, exploring his work, his lifetime uh, encyclopedic looks. And I want to look at the experience of wearing the garments, what it felt like to be inside the garments. Um, so that's where we're so fortunate to have this gift from Patsy Tarr, who also, she herself is very ingrained in the dance community in New York. She started, uh, was a co-founder of Twice Arts Foundation and Twice Arts Magazine, which is a major philanthropic organization that supports the dance uh, community in New York City. Um, and so, you know, her investment in clothing that is entirely engineered to move so beautifully around the body, it just, it's such a lovely connection. And then uh, learning more about um, Bean's work in the 1990s and the way that he was presenting these collections on the runway with dancers um, just blew my mind. It was such an elegant and fun, creative way to share his work with the world. Um, so that's our focus for an upcoming exhibition in the future um, with Jeffrey Bean. So, that's fantastic. I mean, that's really, I, 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 I'm I, not a scholar of Jeffrey Bean. I, I like his work um, and his clothes have always seemed very wearable to me. And, um, you know, because there are many amazing designers whose clothing are not, they're not wearable that well. They're, they're kind of hard to wear, but his stuff is not that that diminishes them. It's just, they're not like, oh, I can just sit down in this chair and have a, have dinner in this, uh, you know, with handlebars, um, uh, where, where his work is so wearable and so interesting in that way. And, and I loved hearing her talk about how comfortable it was or how it moved and how you could do, and the dancer talking about how she could do different kinds of kicks and, you know, jumps and whatnot. Um, and and it really got me thinking in terms of the jumpsuit, um, his, I didn't, I've never really associated him with being this sort of ubiquitous designer of jumpsuits, um, but in a way that like Diane von Furstenberg is ubiquitous with the wrap dress. Um, but that's really interesting. It's an interesting thing to know, like take away. I love these conversations because I always learn something from everything that happens. So 
Well, and in the video, the dancer was wearing what uh, the two original jumpsuits that she wore in the very first presentation that she ever did with Jeffrey Bean. Those are hers, which she put back on to film herself dancing. And the choreography she she did inspired by that time, by by those memories. So she awesome. recreated, you know, her own her own choreography there. But yeah, it was just wonderful that that those uh, jumpsuits had survived and they're in such great condition and they just fit so perfectly and moved. So so easily and just so elegant. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's move on to your next presentation. Excuse me. So I have a um, quick uh, PowerPoint that I wanted to share with everyone to give you some um, views of the fashion design collection here at the museum. So just wanted to share uh, some background information about this amazing collection and some of the exciting exhibitions that I've been able to work on the last few years. Uh, we are located in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, we're still really hot right now, so don't come just yet. Wait just a couple more months and it's going to be perfect. But we have a beautiful facility uh, opened in the late 1950s, over 200,000 square feet of exhibition space. Um, and we have about, uh, we have nine different areas that we we exhibit um, an eighth that we collect in. We have a wonderful agreement with um, the Center for, Collection, uh, Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, Arizona, where we borrow uh, many, many, many works and exhibit. We have a gallery dedicated to photography. Oh, fantastic. So our fashion design collection was founded in 1966 uh, by the Arizona Costume Institute. Um, we have a dedicated fashion design gallery, the Kelly Elman Fashion Design Gallery. I know Kelly is a, a member of Costume Society as well, and I hope you're able to join us this evening. Um, but the collection is in uh, such great debt uh, to Kelly and her wonderful vision and support of the collection. Um, we have uh, men's, women's, children's wear, uh, 18th century to the present. Um, we focus on high fashion, um, mostly Western European and American designers. And uh, the majority of the collection is women's wear, majority dresses. Um, as I said, we were founded by the Arizona Costume Institute, um, modeled after the Costume Institute. Oh. At the and ACI is the most marvelous group of human beings. They support the collection, new acquisitions, exhibitions, openings, speakers, um, and then just wonderful en enthusiasm around the different topics that we explore here at the museum. We produce two original exhibitions uh, every year and on occasion bring in some tours. The collection, um, as I said, it spans uh, quite a few uh, different centuries. Uh, we have amazing pieces on, on your left here. You can see a waistcoat from um, the early 1800s, and it has just this incredible um, uh, uh, embroidery on the surface, beautiful corsets throughout. Our collection boasts a wonderful um, list of, of uh, mid 19th century, uh, mid 20th century couture designers um, Chanel, Fortuny, Dior, uh, Balenciaga, uh, 21st century designers as well. We have um, a few um, wonderful uh, members here in the Valley that are. A great supporters of uh, Ralph Rucci. And so we've got quite a few really extraordinary pieces from his work in our collection. Um, our collection boasts a couple really wonderful archives. The Jeffrey Bean archive, uh, we watched that video. Uh, that archive holds about 400 different objects. Um, jumpsuits, dresses, separates, and some accessories. Wow. But we also have what we call the Anne Bonfoy Taylor archive. Um, Anne Bonfoy Taylor um, lived uh, the majority of her adult life in Colorado, and she amassed an incredible collection of 20th century couture designers, Charles James, Balenciaga, Givenchy. What you can see in the background here is her collection of Hermes hunting ensembles, head to toe, inside and out, socks included. And they're extraordinary. The belts, the hats, the gloves, every piece. 
Um, we also have an incredible archive called the Emphatics Archive. This was a boutique in Philadelphia that closed in the early 2000s. And this, uh, the boutique was run by uh, James and Karen Legato, and they collected and sold um, key avant-garde designers of the 20th and 21st century. And wow. upon closing out their store, Phoenix Art Museum was incredibly lucky and had many wonderful supporters to step in and bring the remaining collection to Phoenix Art Museum. And what you can see here is a major exhibition of that, of those works when they arrived. I was, I was if I can interject, I was gonna ask, like with the Bouffre uh, collection and this one, which are both out of state, like how did you, with the emphatics, like, Fascinating. How did you collect them, or was was Anne Bouffre connected to the Anne Bouffre Buffet Taylor? Pardon me. Um, was she connected to the Phoenix Museum in some way, or the Phoenix community, or like that's really fascinating. So um, the uh, Bonboy Taylor collection came to the museum in two uh, two thousand seven two thousand eight, right around then, and um, um, there was a phone call to the museum, um, and I. Um, uh, the curator, uh, Danita Sewell, and I, at the time, I was an assistant for her, and uh, they were in Colorado, and so we uh, flew out to Colorado and um, were able to assess the collection there in the family home, and then once we understood and cataloged it, uh, flew back, and then a, uh, she flew out again with someone else, and they loaded everything in a truck and brought it back. Um, the emphatics archive, I wasn't here when that when that connection occurred, but I do know that there is a wonderful list of very dedicated supporters that were involved in financing that important gift. It was really incredible and a huge, a beautiful exhibition. Galliano, Mugler, Gautier, on and on and oh, on. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. It looks really fantastic. Miyaki, uh, it, it's just, it's, it's incredible. And, and I mean, look what, look what the, the curator did with the, the headpieces and the wigs and, and the accessories. It, it was, it was stunning. It was stunning. So I uh, had the great fortune of joining the museum in September of 2019. And my first exhibition was India Fashion's Muse. So we were looking at the influence of uh, dress traditions from India, the paisley, the cashmere shawl, the sari, and the, the great influence that it's had on global fashion. So um, I wanted to just share some of my favorites from that exhibition. You're looking at a paper sari, the bright green and purple. That's by Elisa Daggs, 1967. It's all paper. That's four yards of paper. Um, our textile conservator, Martha Grimm, I know she signed on today. Hi, Martha. Hey, we are shout so, out to Martha Graham. I know, CSA loves Martha. We are so lucky to have Martha here in Arizona, and um, we just got to have her here on campus last week, and um, uh, we're just so grateful for the work that she does with us. So she prepared uh, this paper, sorry, over a few months, um, and we were able to bring in some sari drapers and they wrapped and draped the sari, only tying it with cotton um, um, grow grain so that it's all just tension and tied. But another one of my favorites from this exhibition is the one we're looking at on the left is the Givenchy, the, uh, the robin's egg blue. So it is, um, it's, a, it's inspired by the sari and it's this beautiful um, figured uh, lame and um, uh, uh, blue ground. And it has this really great paisley motif. But what I wanted to show you all is how it unwinds. So on your left, you can see a seam emanating from center front. You see that and it's wrapping down to that proper yeah. right front hip. So that's a dart. Uh, then off to that far proper right armhole, you see that seam. That's the side seam that becomes the back waist seam and then dips back up to the other side seam. Oh, wow. Yeah, look at this. You can see it here. So now we've unwrapped from the shoulder. We've dropped it down from proper right shoulder. And we've wrapped around to the left side. And you can see, you know, oh. wearing a draped garment, but we are fully corseted underneath because we're not taking any chances. <laughs> So you can see the back of this uh, structured garment underneath, all these really great snaps down the back. But then on the right, you can see that curved seam, which I just love. And then that long, um, the seam bisecting it, going um, 
uh, perpendicular down to the floor. That starts at the proper right hip and then ends at center back. Him. Oh, wow. Okay, so I, I just want to clarify something. This is fantastic. I love seeing, we love seeing the inside of clothes. Thank you so much. Um, so in the left picture with the, with the, where we see the back of the mannequin, the folded down portion of the dress is what actually snaps to the lower portion of the back. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And so is it, is it, does it also snap or is it actually stitched to that little underskirt where the fold begins? Or is that, um, is that, have you just pinned it there for the photo? It's stitched. It's all stitched. It has oh, a zipper wow. there at the proper left. There's a zipper? There's a zipper at the proper left. Oh, wow. Yep. I'm sorry. I should have turned it. Just if I could just turn it. Oh, I uh, can see. I can see. Okay. Left a little bit of the placket that's covering up the zipper yep. and then the garment wraps around and then there's just one little snap that you can see on the curved seam you can see a little bitty snap right there oh, right yeah. next to the baby dart uh -huh. that that snap will connect at the back left shoulder at the back uh close to the neck and that's the only thing holding it to the body otherwise it's connected at the shoulder right and that's the only thing really controlling the, the shape is what I mean. It's it's on there, it's all stitched together. So this one was just marvelous. So after that exhibition, then we uh, opened Collective Inspiration. Collective Inspiration blended all the different collective areas at the museum. So in the front here, you can see a uh, Chato Ralph Rucci with a, uh, a, a, a Sutaka, um, uh, Sutoko uh, uh, stoneware vase here. And to the left, Mary Catranzo, so we're looking at photography. In the back is um, Alexander McQueen. But in this, we were looking at the different ways artists can achieve a similar aesthetic, a similar outcome, a similar feeling, a similar expression with these incredibly different moments, materials, time periods, inspiration. So one of my favorite pairings in this exhibition is this beautiful Fortuny ensemble and specifically the jacket with this uh, Tiffany vase. So similar time period, 1920s, 1930s, and obviously colors what we're looking at here, but when we really dive into how these artists and designers created these colors, had their hands in the work, they were the ones manipulating the materials, that's where it just, it's electric. Because Fortuny, as we know, is creating his own dyes, he's dipping his fabrics multiple, dozens of times to get those subtle um, undertones. So it's a, a beautiful changeant that he's created. Uh, uh, Louis Comfort Tiffany, same thing. Um, he was infusing materials into the glass during the molten stage, really creating new ways of um, forming these materials so that when the glass cooled, the iridescence comes from inside of the glass instead of sitting on the surface, which was the traditional method up until that point. So it's that amazing blend of these, these the scientist artist. It, it's just, um, and playing with light, light and color. So in the museum right now, we have two fashion exhibitions. The first is Fearless Fashion, Rudy Gernrich. This is on view, uh, on tour from the Skirball uh, uh, Cultural Center in Los Angeles. Um, and it's not an overview of his life's work. It's an intersection of social justice and fashion. Um, it has some of his real key pieces, the monokini topless bathing suit here. Um, this is a look from upstairs. It's in our steel gallery, which is our largest exhibition space. Um, and you can see the different zones. Uh, off to the left, we have a couple zones as well that you're just not able to see in this photograph. Um, but if you see the red, the two com combined there, um, those two pieces, it's called the duo tard. Just a lot of real fun, playful, theatrical uh, work that he was doing all the while incredibly interested in 
uh, social movements for equality that were happening across the board uh, throughout the 1960s and 70s. Um, and it was his formative years were in theater and dance. So uh, he uh, was always very expressive in his designs, but then he was also very forward thinking in, in, uh, in uh, his interest in technology and using uh, new materials and uh, new devices that were available, experimenting with zippers circling the body. Um, here we have the thong and the no bra bra that he gave us. Um, which effectively really uh, impacted uh, the way all of our clothing fit because things hang very differently when uh, the undergarments are structuring things differently. In the back, very back corner of this picture, uh, you can see a white suit. And I'm pointing that out because it's gonna relate to a picture we're gonna look at here in a minute, but that's his Marlena Dietrich suit. Oh, excellent. Yes. Um, so these are, again, a, a look at some of the uh, dance inspired work. Uh, these were, um, he did uh, work with uh, the Bella Lewitsky uh, company, and this was part of her series called Inscape. And the one in the back, the red, it's called a duotard. Two human bodies fit into that single costume at the same time. It's fantastic. It's such a mind meld and blend of how clothing works and what it means and and uh, just such a cool concept too when we dressed that piece because it's connected between two people there's a little dip in the middle and it took five of us to hold and manage all the mannequins and one person's job was to just hold this one piece of fabric so it couldn't stretch it was a, a lot of fun very important that's a, that is an excellent exhibition. I saw it in the, at the Skirball when it was here in Los Angeles, and the pieces that are in it are really wonderful. So if you are, uh, you know, if you, uh, viewers, if you are in the Phoenix area or going to Phoenix anytime soon, since now we can travel again, uh, stop and see these. They're, it's a really, really great exhibit. I pr pr am particularly fond of the white one in front of it uh, with the really long train uh, of, on the leg behind it. It's really quite spectacular. And there's even um, leather footies that are stitched into, because the train goes under the feet. I know, I know. I've been. I would yeah. love to see inside of this cost of this garment. I'll send you a picture. Yay! We'll include it in here. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, I'll slip in and take some pictures. Um, it's so great, and of course the poles aren't part of the costume. They're there for the drama of the install. But as you can see in the little image of the label. They recreated some of the poses. They had some of these mannequins 3D printed so that they could recreate them very specifically, which is just phenomenal. It, it yeah. really brings Absolutely. it to life. Yeah, that's a question that just popped up in the chat about are they custom mannequins in those dance poses, uh, but throughout the exhibition. So thank you for catching that and, and answering that. I love that yeah. they were 3D printed because I was curious about, I've been, ever since I saw this, I was like, where did they find a mannequin to do that? They worked with a fabricator in Los Angeles to 3D print them. And then they also, uh, it, throughout the exhibition, the mannequins are flat footed. Um, which is, you know, important for Rudy's ensembles. Um, and then they 3D printed a few of the specific ones. And then these mounts are out of a wool felt and they're all custom uh, hand stitched. We have a video, we did a conversation with uh, the, the two of the curators that worked on this exhibition and also built the mounts. And we recorded that conversation, Arizona Costume Institute um, hosted this conversation with them. So we'll find that link and I'll share that with you and we could plug that on to the end of this. Um, oh, because absolutely. it has tons of behind the scenes information of oh, how- Oh, great, they that's they wonderful, have. that's wonderful. It's Great. So also in the building, we have our original production um, exhibition, Fashion Subversives, where we're looking at moments where fashion broke the rules in big ways and in small ways. So inspired in the, the theme of Rudy. So we have five different sections. We start with subverting gender to dress. So remember when I pointed out the Marlena suit, the white suit? Well, 
the reason I pointed that out is so at one end of the museum, we have the Marlena Dietrich suit, white satin, 1964, it's beautiful. And at the other end of the museum, we have 1967 Yves Saint Laurent tuxedo suit. These two moments in fashion history are really quite important. Um, in 1964, that white suit wasn't allowed to walk the runway. They pulled it at the last minute. It was supposed to walk the runway at the American Fashion Design Awards. And um, this suit, um, the original was released in 1966. It was okay, but this one in 1967, just gorgeous. The proportions are right. And then after this, Yves Saint Laurent releases a tuxedo version in every single collection, which is just amazing. So we look at the tuxedo. Uh, behind that, we can see uh, a Mugliere off to the right, um, a Jeffrey Bean jumpsuit version to the left, and another Yves Saint Laurent behind it. We have a, set, a section where we're talking about subverting the social order of things. So we have uh, a suffragette bodice, uh, um, sash with a blouse underneath, and we have some pink pussy hats. Great. So this, uh, and, and, and this pairing, uh, this is talking about how fashion can sometimes be that codifying element that brings people together. It's it's that signal that, oh, we, we have the same idea. We're here for the same reason. We're standing up for the same thing. We're united in some way. And specifically, these white, this all white look was really critical. Uh, it made people really stand out in a crowd. It really showed, you know, just how many people were part of this movement. Um, but what I love about it is to me, it also felt a little like it was making sure people didn't get too concerned that women were, you know, getting ready to change the world because, you know, it's like, don't worry, we're still in our lace. It's going to be fine. I mean, let's mobilize, but we're still, don't worry. It's fine. We're still in our lace. We're not going to change everything. So I think part of it was that we didn't, you know, women didn't want to scare everyone. Um, but the real point here is to this incredible sash. Um, I, I included a close-up view of the sash because it's incomplete. Um, and so we reached out to a uh, textile dyer that we work with sometimes. Um, her name is Shelby Joyner, and she is the master dyer for the opera in many different theaters here. And she came out, did an analysis of the ex existing sash, and then recreated a piece um, and did a lot to work with it to try to create some texture and try to match it as much as she could. Uh, I just thought that that would give it a special, I wanted to, to, for people to be able to see it in the round and to be able to understand how it would uh, look. Another section we have is subverting the uh, status quo by transcending class. So we're looking at the little black dress, which is such a fascinating story. Um, you see, we have Vogue magazines that we've included. We have uh, at the museum, we have a wonderful library and uh, the uh, Kathy Lemon Library. And within that, uh, we have the Astaire Fashion Design Collection uh, dedicated just for uh, the fashion collection. And within that, we also have um, a wonderful physical collection of the Vogue archive. So we oh, have wow. access to the digital Vogue archive on our computer and we love to invite people, students especially, students come to our library and hop on and you can access the Vogue archive. But we also have physical copies um, that uh, we've been collecting over the years. And again, Kelly Elman has been a major part of that initiative to find those physical copies. And so I brought those out and wanted to share them in the exhibition. So that's what you can see in this photograph. So. Here we're looking at the little black dress through decades, um, looking at the way that uh, this style has just become a uh, ubiquitous part of our uh, everyday dress now. Um, another section in subverting the status quo is textiles of the future. So we look at the paper dress trend of the 1960s. We look at the use of PVC and other non-traditional uh, materials. We look at the Speedo uh, racer suit from um, the 2008 uh, Olympics where um, the suits broke so many world records and speed records that they were um, uh, not allowed in uh, global competition after that uh, event um, because the technology was just so good. Uh, looking at Issey Miyake's piece of cloth. Um, 
Another section that we have is subverting morality and decency. So here we look at the history of the bathing suit, really leading up to the bikini. Um, so here in the front, we have a picture of um, uh, Jean Rayard's uh, 1946 bikini. Um, and then we have um, a wonderful Emilio Pucci and then uh, off to the right, our Rudy Gernrich topless suit. But also part of that section, we look at skirt lengths. So we look at uh, the rising skirt length of the 1920s and the mini skirt of the 1960s. So here on the left, we've got uh, Coco Chanel uh, with a Jeffrey Beam. And this is one of my favorite pairings in the exhibition. Um, I think it's a, a, a real fun look at those skirt lengths from two designers that um, I think would be fascinating to hear their opinion of skirt lengths and trends and where they fall within that because they were both such singular designers that didn't seem to be terribly wrapped up in trends. So I'd be very curious to hear their, hear, hear their uh, off the cuff comments to each other on that. And I'm loving the giant safety pins on the dress on the other side. Isn't that marvelous, the Versace from the 90s? So here we're looking at underwear as outerwear. I mean, that's such a fascinating trend. We really associate that mostly with the 90s, but I mean, we've got Balenciaga 1960s and a little lingerie baby doll lace number, which is just so alluring. Um, and then if we think back to uh, Marie Antoinette in the 18th century wearing her, you know, all white linen <laughs> chemise uh, all over the all it's you know our our history of of titillating underwear as outerwear it, it's quite long and robust and it's not over um so our last section is subverting reality so here we're looking much more uh we're taking a step back and this is much more how designers are changing the way the human body looks um, so did we grow an extra pair of legs or is that a bustle? Um, so we've got a, a beautiful uh, um, side hoops here uh, from uh, 1760s, a spittle filled silk, uh, a maiden form chassinet or bullet bra, missile bra, um, and a bustle uh, from our third bustle period. Um, again, just changing the shape of the human form. And then also looking at designers that are changing the shape of the human body using optical illusion. So uh, lenticular manipulation with Alexander McQueen and trompe l'oeil with Moschino and this really great roller printed mid 19th century. And it's the, this wonderful blue lace effect on the, the skirt <clears throat> and the sleeve cuffs. So that's really the, what I've been working on the last couple of years here at the museum. I was so lucky to get to join and really lock in right before the pandemic. And we were fortunate to be able to shift gears and reach out to people. Um, but I just wanted to quickly share with you our oldest piece because oh, I figured excellent. this might be a question. So this is our oldest piece in the collection. It's a pair of gloves. Obviously, we're just looking at one here. Uh, uh, 1760, gorgeous leather. If they were worn, it was maybe twice. Um, it's metal lace, a very fine, very thin metal wire lace in incredible condition. And then what you can see here is I was preparing it to go on view, and I, re I had to construct a thumb because every time I put it up, the thumb would fall down. So I had to put a thumb, I was trying to get away without having to do a thumb, but it wouldn't work. And then the last image I wanted to share is uh, um, something that I uncovered uh, not too long ago, but to me was just such an interesting um, curiosity that I wanna look more into. And it, it's a training corset for a preteen young woman, uh, mid 19th to early uh, 1900s and um, just, not much information on it yet, but discovered this the other day, and it's such a beautiful curiosity. Um, so this, for me, is one of the most interesting new things, new discoveries in the collection. Is this cording that's in the corset, um, or it it has a little bit of a of, of a lightweight boning in it? It's got a oh, rigid it structure in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I was wondering if that was like cording or cane or some kind of, you know, something 
because uh, it's so perfectly round. Um, okay. Um, yeah. I love the Moschino dress at the end that you showed uh, with the trompe l'oeil. Uh, uh, I once designed a children's show many, many years ago on a very low budget where all the costumes were trompe l'oeil. <laughs> love that that's so great um okay so um thank you so much that was fantastic let's open the floor up to questions from the audience um one of the questions that has popped up is um uh the white dress in the in the garnrick exhibition that we talked about do you know if that dress was worn by martha by martha graham the white dress. Oh, I'm guessing the dance costume, the swan, maybe. Yeah. I don't think. I I don't think so. But um, I can find out. Well, that would be awesome. Yeah. Another person has. Um, uh, a couple of other people have posted some clarification clarifications in the chat about Martha Graham um, and her relationship with Halston and then Rudy Gernrich being inspired by Martha Graham. So check those out in that indeed. I have a question that I want to include and I might be putting Martha Grimm on the spot, but Martha, would you please turn your camera on and your microphone? Because I have a question for you. <laughs> it's a, you're a surprise guest star today. <laughs> okay, all right, Leon. So tell me um, about the con conservation of that paper sari. What was that like? I am dying to know. Well, it takes lots of patience. And we use a, a technique where it's um, a, a yeah. vortex piece that is has been made that conservators use that is Gore-Tex and then it has a felt on the back of it and it changes small amounts of water into a vapor so that what ended up going onto the paper was just a mist, just a touch of water. And so that's the way the creases were taken out. Oh, fantastic. I was curious, like when you received, when you, when you started working on it, was it um, heavily creased? Um, oh yeah! That you, oh yeah! Um, it was a little little package. Oh wow! You know, it was all folded up in, in a package. Uh, Helen can tell you it it uh, was a thing given out by an airline, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. It was, and and wow. airlines did this, giving out paper dresses. Um, many of you know that my husband was uh, a pilot for TWA. And during the 60s, their flight attendants wore paper clothing. And when they were spilled on, you could see through the paper. Yeah. And it did not make the flight attendants very happy when, because, you know, they're working with food and in the galleys right. and stuff. And there they were on, more of them was on display than they wished. Indeed. So, indeed. Um, yeah, but this this paper sorry was of a from a different airline. What um what what is the age of the what is the date of the paper sorry? Is it also from the sixties? Nineteen sixty seven. Wow. Now that was the heyday of well, and and Helen, you could tell them what comes next with the paper clothing. Yeah, so our next exhibition is paper. So actually last week we just sent home twin, sent 20 objects uh, to Martha's studio for her to continue um, processing and treating a variety of paper objects and they're all different materials. I mean, we say, we're gonna use the term paper, but as Martha's gonna be able to let us know, they're a variety of different materials, some much more plastic, a lot very much cellulosic, it's a variety. Wow. wow, awesome. Now that uh, when I saw, because I love paper clothing and I find it really fascinating. Um, and uh, as a designer for stage, I've done things with paper and and cardboard and unusual materials. I love working with unusual materials. So that, I've never seen a paper sari and I was just like, I mean, everybody's aware of like the other paper dresses from the sixties. Um, and, uh, but that was just really fascinating to see that. Um, All we have in my lab right now is a bikini, a paper bikini 
a caftan, and uh, quite a few sundresses. Wow. All made of paper. And they have a variety of different fibers from 100% rayon to uh, polypropylene, um, which surprised me. I, my, my good buddy, Margaret Odonia, sent me information today about the date of polypropylene, which was in the 50s, because I was really questioning about that. And the other thing she sent me was a chapter from her forthcoming book that she wrote with Kelly Ready Best, which uh, has a chapter on how to care for paper clothing. Oh, fantastic. That's awesome. That's fantastic. We're going to need an advanced it, copy of that book. For <laughs> well, it's 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 going to be published soon, um, and it's on problems of 20th century dress. Oh, I mean, you know, the number of different materials that we encounter. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Uh -huh. I mean, from plastic to PVC to mm -hmm. metal. Yeah, all of that. All of that yeah. stuff. That's, yeah. you know, continuous. Yeah. So, cool. Um, thank you so much, Martha. I'm sorry to put okay, you on Okay, I'm going to turn off my camera. <laughs> You're free to go. <laughs> Martha, that was delightful. So, yeah, so next we're going to look at paper. And then um, a, a project that I'm really, really excited, in addition to build, because we're building the Jeffrey Bean exhibition for the future, but a, a project that I'm really excited that I'm also working on, we're going to look at the history of camouflage, which Ooh. is a fascinating story. World War I, dazzle ships, there were bathing suits inspired by this with all the crazy stripes. There was a ball in 1919 that was, they let these naval officers decide the decor and they did it based on dazzle ships. And the photographs are amazing and these costumes are incredible. Um, but then looking at the military history and then the crossover into fashion through rap, culture skate culture it's just incredible um, when does that when does that open when does that come about to, well it was supposed to actually be the next show and then i put a hard pause on that we're moving into the future because it's too big it's too exciting and um so we're still setting a date for that but probably two years because it's a big big cool. big story oh, so good. I, I, I'm putting my name on that story, world. That's ours. <laughs> Excellent. I will put that in my calendar to keep an eye out for it in two years. It's going to be um, amazing. It's gonna that be would be really interesting. Like camouflage is its own undiscussed subject. There's yeah. so much about camo that's interesting and bizarre and cool all yeah. at the same time. So. It's incredible. And, and, you know, and it just furthers that conversation of how we use clothing to connect with each other, which, I mean, for me, that's why I'm here. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to send another quick shout out. I see another person on our list, uh, Marisa Lijon, who um, uh, was a, 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 came on as an intern and then stayed on as a vault assistant. And she only, uh, she just relocated to Nevada, but she was incredibly helpful in all of the exhibition photography you just saw in the PowerPoint that I gave in the Jeffrey Bean film. She was a huge part of that. And so we love Marisa and we wish she would move back to Arizona. This has been so all encompassing and great information. It's been super fun uh, to see. And I, I loved the breadth of what you guys are talking about. Um, and the, um, how do, oh, actually, here's this question. I'll have one. How do um, people come and do research at your museum? Um, is your collection open to scholars to look at and to, you know, to, to come and check out things? It is. We are open to um, research visits that goes through our registrar's office to schedule a visit with them. And then we can schedule uh, time in the vault to pull objects and take a look at them. We also have space that we can pull objects out of the vault. Um, because of the world and the condition that, uh, for travel is a bit challenging. Um, of course, we're, we're uh, doing all COVID protocol. The, museum be, the museum's been incredibly stringent, which has been really nice. It's a very comfortable, safe uh, environment. And, um, but we, uh, my point there is we can do some video research as well. So oh. um, the opportunity to pull some things out and, and, and look through the vault, uh, look through uh, video um, at objects in the vault, that's possible. 
Um, so yeah, I encourage people to do, please uh, reach out and let us know if you've got projects to work on. Um, and like I said, we've got our wonderful uh, Vogue, physical Vogue archive and access to the Vogue archive online for our local students. Awesome, great. There's one last question, comment, um, and then we will wrap it up for the day. Uh, viewer states that fabulous about the camouflage. Don't forget to add that if I understand correctly, Yves Saint Laurent was the first to put camouflage on the high fashion runway, I think in 71. Is this correct? Is that from oh. your research? I know that that's when, right when Vogue said, oh yeah, camo is, camo's like denim. You can mix it with anything. Camo and stilettos are ready to go. <laughs> um, I'm putting this in my notes and I'm going to double check our Yves Saint Laurent quote. <laughs> Awesome. So we will we will get back to you, viewer, on that one, uh, and I'm sure it will be included in the exhibition. But thank you for the query, um, Helen. That's great. Thank, That's great. <laughs> thank you so much. This has been this has been so much fun and so delightful, and such a wonderful breadth of things to see. Um, and so I just you know everyone in the audience, please give Helen a big you know, round of applause at home. And if you're in Phoenix, please go check out the collection. Um, and with that, I will say once again, thank you for joining us today on Dress and Drinks. Thank you, Helen, again, very much. This has been just delightful. And I look forward to getting to know you more. And when I'm in Phoenix, I will give you a call and we can have coffee and, and I want a backstage tour. Yes, and I want to hear more about um, your costume designing. And also, I see one of my former um, instructors, Mary Rupert, is on here. Hi. And I think Kathy May, our former, uh, some of our ACI members are on here. Thank you so much for hopping on. CSA, thank you. I'm so honored. Uh, this is an amazing collection. I'm just a small part of a huge job here. And um, thank you for giving us the microphone for a minute. We're, we think we do some really valuable work here. So. And that's what we're trying to do with this program is to raise some awareness about the wonderful collections, big and small, throughout our country um, and throughout each of the regions that CSA has, because there's stunning, stunning pieces out there that we just don't know about. Um, and so we're looking forward to, to doing more of this. So join in every month, last Wednesday of the month, and uh, we will we'll have more of this to come. So thank you, Helen, again, and have have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.